Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. This actually, my name is Whitney Donhauser, and I'm the Rone Menchel Director here at the Museum of the City of New York. And we are just so thrilled with tonight's um, presentation. So I know that while uh, right now it does not look like we're completely sold out, we are well sold out. Um, and so what I would love to do is if you have a space or seat in between you, if you could please move over and make sure that you don't have your coats and bags on a seat, because we do have people that we have directed to an overflow room that we're going to try to bring in to squeeze in and fill up the seats. And then we also know that we've got people who are coming from a long distance. So um, we, as I said, are thrilled to be able to present the Black is Beautiful Fashion and Consciousness, which is our first program in conjunction with our exhibition, Mod New York, Fashion Takes a Trip. So Mod New York, uh, if you haven't seen it, explores the full arc of art and fashion in the 1960s when traditions were challenged, rejected, and reimagined. And going through the exhibition, you do really see that. So this was curated by Phyllis Magnuson, who is our Elizabeth Farron Tozer Curator of Costumes and Textiles, and Donald Albrecht, who is our Curator of Architecture and Design. And you will get an opportunity after this discussion to go upstairs and see the exhibition. But if you don't have a chance, it's on view until April 1st. So tonight's program will take a closer look at the Black is Beautiful movement featured in the exhibition and specifically the work of photographer Kwame Brothwaite. Brothwaite was the leading documentary photographer of the Black arts and culture movement, which took shape here in New York City in the 1960s. So he started as as a jazz photographer and helped form the African Jazz Art Society and Studios, or otherwise known as A-Jazz, um, which launched the Black is Beautiful movement through concerts, fashion shows, events, and photography. So we are honored that he is here tonight and that he'll join us at the end of the program to talk about his work. So in addition tonight, we're so thrilled to have his son, Kwame Brothwaite Jr., the fashion designer, Mimi Plange, and the historian, Tanisha Ford, to discuss the impact and the legacy of this pioneering work. So following the program, as I said, we invite all of you to go upstairs to the third floor and also to visit our shop, which is on the first floor, where we not only have our Mod New York catalog for sale, but also Dr. Ford's book, Liberated Threads, Black Women Style and the Global Politics of Soul. So tonight, our program is um, presented in conjunction with Carnegie Hall's 2018 Citywide Festival, the 1960s, the years that changed America. Um, if you didn't see it, uh, there's a program that was on the table for all of the programs in the series. They have an incredible lineup of events throughout the whole city. Um, so the schedule is available, and um, we really want to thank tonight our promotional partners for this event, and you can find a complete list of those promotional partners in your programs that are on your seats. So for the rest of the next program in our Mod New York series is 60s Fashion, The Youth Quake and Its Aftershocks, which is on Wednesday, March 14th at 6.30, and we'll have designer Andrea Arnau and Anna Sui. Uh, we'll discuss how the 1960s influenced their work in a conversation conversation moderated by the fashion historian Hazel Clark. So you can register online um, on the museum's website, mcny.org. Um, so also, we love it when people use social media here, Instagram, Facebook, or if you want to tweet about our programs, we just encourage you to use our hashtag MCNY um, live for that. So please feel free to do that. Um, and now it is my great honor to introduce our moderator, Tanisha Ford. She will then introduce the panelist and launch the conversation. And Dr. Ford is an associate professor of Africana Studies and History at the University of Delaware. She's the author, as I said before, of Liberated Thread, Black Women, Style, and the Global Politics of Soul, which was produced by uh, University of North Carolina Press in 2015. So please join me in welcoming everybody on stage, and thank you. Good evening. 
Welcome to Black is Beautiful, Fashion and Consciousness. <laughs> it's an honor to moderate what I know will be a dynamic and visually spellbound, spellbinding conversation about Kwame Brathwaite's photography rooted in New York City's history of activism and fashion innovation. So first I want to um, introduce our panelists, just say a few brief words. Kwame Brathwaite Sr. is gonna join us on stage in a few minutes, but I'll introduce him now. Um, he has been considered the ever-present documentary photographer of the black arts and culture movement. He started as a jazz photographer and helped to form the African Jazz Art Society and Studios, otherwise known as AJAZ, which launched the Black is Beautiful movement through concerts, fashion shows, events, and photographs. He also took pictures of iconic events, such as the Rumble in the Jungle and the Jackson Five's trip to Africa in 1974. Next, we have Kwame S. Brathwaite, son of photographer Kwame Brathwaite, who manages his father's photographic archive and engages in collaborative projects that reflect the varied themes of his father's work, activism, politics, fashion, and music. And he also has a very beautifully written piece in the Mod New York um, exhibition book, so make sure you check that out. And then beside me is designer Mimi Plange. Mimi Plange is a Ghanaian-born designer who launched her ready-to-wear label in 2010 using Africa as a limitless font of inspiration. Plange's designs have been worn by former First Lady Michelle Obama, Rihanna, among others. Her work has been featured in publications including the New York Times. And again, I am Tanisha Ford. I'm Associate Professor of Africana Studies and History at the University of Delaware and the author of Liberated Threads. Now, tonight, we're gonna take you on a bit of a journey. We're gonna travel through time and space for the next hour or so, sharing with you images and video clips as our panelists offer commentary. Kwame Sr. will join us a bit later on in the evening, and then we'll open up for questions, we'll open up the audience uh, to the audience for questions so that you all can engage with us as well. Yes. All right. So this is going to be very visually oriented because we really want you to see this movement and understand how it feels here. So I want to start off by hearing from Kwame Brathwaite on how he became interested in photography. So to do that, we're going to watch a, a brief video clip. Well, I got started photography while I was producing some jazz concerts in, um, in the Bronx, Club 845. And uh, one of the students uh, that had going to high school of industrial art, as did some of the members of AJS, the, the concert promoting group that they had. Um, he came to take some pictures. He had studied photography. I had studied uh, uh, advertising art in, in Lambe, uh, my brother, who um, was the founder of AJS, African Jazz Art Society and Studios. Um, he was a leader. He had graduated in 54. I graduated in 55. Robert Gums in 56 or 57. And several others that got together to decided that we were going to, uh, we were coming out of the, the, um, the doo-wop years and started listening to what we would call progressive music at the time. And that was uh, jazz. And this is all the old, the old jazz masters and uh, the popular tunes of the time. So um, um, one of the students uh, who came um, to one of our concerts, and he was shooting, he was shooting uh, with camera, no flash, and um, it was a weekly series of concerts. So uh, the following week he came back and he had pictures, and I just fell in love with the, 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 the texture, the, you know, slight greeniness of it. It was um, super double X film at the time, the predecessor of Tri X, um, which is a high speed film, so that you get more feeling instead of having to use flash to shoot the shots. And I liked what he, he, he uh, showed. 
and um, I dug out my little camera that I got for graduation, and uh, that was the August '75, which was just a um, fixed focus camera. Um, you had to plug in a flash flash uh, um, uh, holder, put in a number five flash bulb, shoot it. Take it out while it's hot, so he can get the next shot. You know, it was it was definitely not the kind of thing that um, uh, you could use to shoot like uh, the other shot. But it got me into picking up the camera, and my uncle, uh, one of my uncles, who had was living with us. We had a Browns home in uh, on Kelly Street in the Browns, and um, he came to live with us uh, after he had had an accident. In um, at work, and, and uh, I mean, it was in in Jersey on a press which cut off four fingers of his right hand. And at the time, you know, um, uh, as usual, you usually try to get you to take up a hobby, something to keep your mind busy, and do something, you know, to keep up. Uh, and so he took a uh, a correspondence course. I think it was. Uh, School of Photography or something like that. So he had some tanks and reels around because uh, we were processing, teaching how to process on film and whatnot. And I watched him a while and he showed me how to do that. So I started, when I take pictures, started to uh, develop my own film. It was getting uh, a little expensive um, going to the drugstore. It wasn't even the film, you know. Uh, film store or anything like that, or any camera shops um, that was doing that for the most part. It was the drug so you would take it and send it out and it'd come back a couple of days, a week later, something like that. But it got me to start shooting and um, shooting some of the concerts there and, um, and developing my own film. And that's how I got into photography. Isn't that amazing history? Especially considering how so many of us just point and click with our cell phones today to hear him talk about the process of shooting and developing film. So um, Kwame, I also noticed in that clip that your father was mentioning um, the importance of jazz in his photography. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, what the political landscape and the cultural landscape was like in New York City in the 1960s when your father began his career in photography. Yeah. So. Um Thank you. Um, one of the things that we talked about in my many conversations with him and as, as I've been going through this archiving process was the fact that they were, you know, and this stood out to me because they were <clears throat> 16, 17, 18 year olds um, that were really focused in on uh, being kind of progressive. And so they, they chose jazz as their music of choice. And so. Um, as you might have noticed, my father's up in the front. I, I think I've never seen him wear anything but a suit. And so they were always about kind of presenting themselves in a, in a certain way. So always sharp, the son of a, a, they own dry cleaners. And so always sharp, but always about what was going to be the next movement. And so they saw that as jazz. And so at that point in time, they formed their group and uh, they were having these jazz concerts. But the thing that was really amazing to me is at 17 and 18, having a cabaret license, understanding what they would need to do to be in the different clubs around the city, was that they found, they knew where to find all of the popular jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. There was a specific restaurant that they would go to in Midtown and they would go, they couldn't get the headliners, but they could get everyone else in the band and, and they would book them for shows. And so they'd have these phenomenal jazz concerts um, and as they were looking to uh, have the breaks for those concerts, they wanted to do something that was very highbrow, high end, and so they started looking at um, doing African dancers, uh, things that uh, enlivened the culture and, and brought people to their cultural roots, uh, and that's when the fashion show started. But it was, it was this period of um, transition. It was a period of thinking forward and being kind of revolutionary in what they were doing. So Mimi, I'm curious, did you know anything about this history of the Black is Beautiful movement and its roots in, in New York City? Um, 
Thank you very much for having me here, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually quite ashamed to say that I didn't know anything about it, and I had never heard anything about it, um, whether I was um, you know, in any fashion courses that I ever took or any kind of African-American studies classes. Um, I had never heard of it. So this was all very brand new, and when it was brought to my attention, I've been researching everything. I found the New York Times article from, I think, 1971 or 60 something, and um, I just looked up everything, and I was really amazed at the body of work um, that Brathwaite has you know, had for all this amount of time that hasn't been shared with the world. And so um, it would serve as, it's been a huge inspiration. I wish that, you know, before, because we always have this thing when we're talking about um, not, there not being a lot of African American designers or African designers or anything to see in the world, but then to see that there was this whole movement going on and there were designers, ones that, you know, we've never even um, talked about or known about, um, that there's this whole world that was going on. I think it would be beneficial to the designers of today. Right, and it seems to me in this moment, <clears throat> they were, we're seeing a resurgent interest in Black is Beautiful, and so I'm glad that the world is now being introduced to Kwame Brathwaite's photography. And I'm wondering, why do you think that is? Why, why in this current political climate or the cultural climate, even with the excitement around Black Panther, why is everybody interested in Black is Beautiful? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll start, right, but okay. I mean, well, first. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's just, um, it's just now that there's been an, an interest. I think that there's always been an interest. Um, I just think that now with social media and the world becoming smaller and smaller, it's just being brought to light. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't really think that things have changed. I mean, when we go through these images and we see what the women were wearing and how they were putting things together, I mean, you talk about how it started out with this whole idea of jazz, but mod fashion kind of came about through jazz as well. And so it was a time when people wanted to change and people wanted to see new things. There were dramatic lengths and skirts going on and it was, um, there was a lot of different types of fashion going on. And I think right now, um, in fashion, you know, there's been a lot of um, similarities. I think that, you know, fast fashion has slowed down the, um, the love for high fashion and the appreciation of clothes. And so um, now is a time where people are trying to break out and you have really a platform to try and, and do anything new. So I think um, it's just being able to get your work out a little bit quicker because we have social media. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that I've noticed is that as you look back at a lot of the fashions and some of the images that we see, um, it, they are definitely things that people were interested in. Maybe they didn't know, they didn't make the connection necessarily. But I also think in this kind of like Afro-punk and, you know, and all the things that we're seeing, the trends we're seeing today, the movement was really about you know, bringing yourself forth, right? Mm -hmm. Being your true self. And I think people are being more expressive about the way that they kind of wear their clothes. And, you know, I think even in the workplace, you have places where now, you know, you had to go to work in a suit or, or you had to be business attire. Now, as people are being more expressive within their own, um, their own lives, I think that's where you're seeing a lot of that more, a lot more of that come out. Yeah, and I, I love this image, um, by the way, <clears throat> of the Grandasso models. We're gonna watch a video clip of, of Kwame Brathwaite discussing the origins of the Grandassa models in that first Naturally fashion show in 1962, which was held not too far away from here in Harlem. First eight were, uh, models were Clara Lewis, Black Rose, Wanda Sims, Helene Dumsa White, uh, uh, Beatrice Crampson, uh, Priscilla Bardneal, uh, Marie Toussaint, and Esther Davenport. And um, we would be pulled the girls together. Max Roach and Abby Lincoln came and joined us and said, look, and, you know, they would be part of this very first show and, uh, and help us. And they started getting um, um, uh, other stars, you know, to come and support the idea. We could get some press parties and things like that. And, uh, John Oliver Killens and uh, uh, Brock Peters and a whole slew of, of uh, names in it. Uh, um, uh, just past uh, the poet. Uh, oh, Maya? Maya Angelou. Um, and, and, and we got support right from the start. Rosa Guy and, and, and people like that. 
like that, based on Max and Abby's strength. So that's how we uh, 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 started getting a lot more press then too. Um, so we, 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 we put together the show, which we hadn't named the, the models yet. Uh, we had planned to do a show, uh, Black is Beautiful, you know? And it was gonna be just one show, I guess, you know? And um, so we scheduled the show for um, uh, January 28th, uh, 1962, and we called it Naturally 62 original African fashion and quaffure extravaganza designed to restore our rich, original pride and standards. Um, we got our own designers. Since this was designing their own fashions and stuff like that, some of the, 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 the models did, as well as um, uh, young designers out here now taking on Afrocentric uh, uh, flair, you know, uh, 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 using African fabrics, uh, African designs, and it started to now explode. Um, the day of the show, we did the show, and I mean, it was just spectacular. We looked outside, and the people were still outside that couldn't get in. So when we cleared the place, we swept it up, and had a second show that same day. Now look at that, Mr. Brathwaite. You're still packing houses. <laughs> so we heard a little bit about the origins of this show and, and how these shows really became star-studded events that were um, frequented by a lot of the musicians who too were on the front lines of the movement at that time. Um, Kwame, I'm wondering if you could break this down a little bit more for us and, and tell us, step us into the world of a naturally fashion show. What, what were these shows about? So, as I alluded to before, you know, um, what, what they were doing was they were presenting an idea, and they, they had these ideas, and, and they wanted to present them to the audience, and, and mainly it was um, to understand that black is beautiful, but also there was, it wasn't just about, you know, fa jazz and fashion, they had culture, they had dance. You know, they had designs, they had um, the jewelry, they had those aspects. And then um, something that people don't really know about is, is the satirical uh, aspect of the shows because they were Pan-Africanists. And so they were talking about what was happening in uh, not just in the United States, but around the African diaspora. And so they were bringing the community in and embracing their African ancestry, but then also bringing the, the world about, uh, the world to them. So, for instance, um, one of the things we talked about um, was how AJAZ was so politically responsible. And so they were going down to the UN and having, having um, the leaders from the different, different nations or the people who are fighting for their um, liberation come and they would meet them and say, come talk to the people, come be part of this experience. And so this was all a part of painting the picture for African Americans and for Africans abroad about what those struggles were, but also to try to say, you know, look, we gotta embrace, we gotta support, buy black, there's one of those pictures in here. It's about us as a community, a global community. Exactly, and <clears throat> I know when I, I first stumbled across um, Call me Brathwaite's photography. It was when I was a graduate student working on my dissertation, actually, at the Schomburg Center. And the wonderful archivists at the Schomburg were like, well, if you're doing work on natural hair and, and fashion in the early 1960s, you need to see these photographs. And when I watched, when I looked at the images of the fashion shows, I thought, wow, you know, for me, they, they really resonated because I was seeing um, uh, the black fashion show tradition being elevated, right? This idea that we're gonna walk, we're gonna sashay, it's not gonna be just about a stiff stage stroll down the catwalk, you know? We're gonna spin, we're gonna twirl, we're gonna make these garments do their work, you know? And, and I love seeing that being elevated. So Mimi, I'm wondering, with your design eye, when you look at the, the Grandassa models in those early fashion shows, um, what, what to you strikes you as innovative or revolutionary in them? 
Well, one of the, the main things really had to do with um, an excerpt that I read about the shows themselves, and it was that um, the main thing that we, they were trying to portray was unity. And nowadays, you know, when we have fashion shows, you know, the models are all singular. It's about you and your contract and, you know, what you're, you know, what you're trying to say about yourself. Everything is about self. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in this world of selfies and self and me, you know, me, me. And so, um, you know, the, the biggest difference was that, you know, the women would walk down together and it wouldn't be one woman who was, um, you know, portrayed at the front and then another at the back. It was all of us together. Together. And I think that those things probably send a lot of mental image, you know, just information in your head as to how you're going to deal with each other. And I think it was important for the movement. I think now we're probably in a different time. So it would be um, very difficult for, I think, that, well, maybe not impossible, but I mean, I think you can do a show like that. I mean, there's group shows right now where um, we've done in the past like presentations where it's not runway. Um, that's been a new trend where everyone is out on the floor at the same time, but the message is not there. So um, I would say the, the thing that stands out the most is, is the messaging between these women and the impact that it probably had on how they deal with other women. Yeah, you know, Mimi, I want to stick with you for a second here because I'm thinking about the, the larger um, Mod New York exhibition and upstairs, and I hope all of you will check it out if you haven't already. <clears throat> and it seems to me that the 1960s and 70s really loom large in our like collective American imaginary um, as this important fashion moment. And I'm wondering if you think, was this really truly a, a pivotal time in fashion history? Um, yeah, I actually think it was one of the most pivotal times because at that time, um, you not only had, you know, the ideas of the mini skirt coming into effect and then Europe was pushing the bikini, which was very revolutionary. No one was wearing a bikini at that time. And then um, also just the ideals of futurism, like Star Trek was really popular and um, all these ideas, Courage and um, Pierre Cardin, and they were pushing these new looks that were really modern and very sleek. And, and then there was, you know, um, Jacqueline Kennedy and her look um, that was very sophisticated. So at one point in time, there was all these different looks coming about and then the whole idea of hippie you know, coming into effect. And I think if you look at fashion right now, I think that it's reflecting. And I think that that's what's happened because it became so homogenous and I think that things have become the same, that now I think that designers want to break out and do, um, I guess have like their own 60s type of revolution in a new way because I think it has to happen so that we can see new product and see new visions. Right, so I'm looking here at this photograph. This is of Carolee Prince, correct? Yes. Yes. So <clears throat> when I'm listening to what Mimi is saying about how the 1960s and 70s were really truly were this, uh, this pivotal fashion moment, um, <clears throat> I'm wondering why then is black, uh, black is Beautiful such a powerful rallying cry, especially when we look at this, how it's articulated by a black woman uh, jewelry and um, headpiece designer? Well, you know, this is one of my uh, this is one of my favorite images mm -hmm. of Caroline Prince. It's, you know, it evokes a certain sense of kind of just calm when you look at it, uh, at least for me. Uh, I think when you look at what was happening, you know, essence didn't exist at this point in time. So if you are a young African-American woman and you are looking at what everyone is telling you is beautiful, there's no visual representation of that at this point in time. And so what I think um, the reason this resonated so much with so many people is that it gave them a framework. You know, it gave them, it gave them something to see. It gave them something to aspire to. And so when you're looking at these images and what they were talking about, see, the thing is, too, they, they were living it, right? So it wasn't like they talked about it and then, you know, when you saw them, it was a different story. They, they were living this. And so, um, you know, Ajaz, the Grandassas, they were, it was all one group that worked together to put this forward, and so I think that's one of the reasons that it's so um, incredibly powerful and resonates, and, and it's still coming back into it today. 
Yeah, so she was also um, a designer to the stars as well, right? For who are some of the people she designed for? So um, uh, Nina Simone, uh, she did a, she did some head of work for Nina Simone as well as some jewelry, um, and you know, I th currently she did have a shop after that, and so she um, continued on as a designer, and and it's one of those things where when you look back at the um, the whole notion of, okay, you don't have to necessarily go to the big department store to buy what's there, you can actually be in your community, make your own stuff, um, and, and then wear it and wear it proudly, right? And so uh, one of the things that I, I think also resonated with me was the fact that, um, you know, you had women of different sizes uh, because these were not professional models, although if you saw the shows, from what I understand, you would not know that. And so. Um, <laughs> The fact was is that when you take a look at you know different garments and things of that nature, my mom was telling me how oftentimes you would have a piece of fabric and you could design it in multiple different ways. You could wear it in different ways, and based on you know which model was doing it and how she understood and interpreted that particular piece of fabric, then she could wear it in the ways she saw fit. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a one size fits all, but it 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 made your own individuality, personal, and, me, and you could work with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point that you raise here. The concept of do-it-yourself, right? I feel like when I think of the 1960s and 70s, I, th I think of that as being an important part of, of that fashion movement of the era. And so one of the ways we can think about this is like handcrafting your own wares, which is what the Grandassa models often did, but then also this idea of doing it yourself for your own community. So here's the image that you mentioned earlier of about by black, and this is at one of the fashion shows, correct? Yeah, and, and you know, it's, um, um, this is one of the fashion shows, uh, I believe this is at the Purple Manor. Um, and uh, you know you see that you see four of the models out um, wearing different designs, and I think when you when you take a look at that whole do it yourself, the buy black, support the community, they were living that. Um, my aunt Numsa, uh, my mother said, was a phenomenal seamstress, and she would make a lot of the designs as well. And so um, Alambe's Alambe's wife, and so it was one of those things where you're looking at um, how they were creating their own destiny. And then when you look at the fact that the other, a lot of the members from Ajaz, Bob Gums, uh, Alambe, they were all graphic artists. So mm -hmm. the flyers that they put together, you know, with my father's photography and, and their graphic designs, they painted the picture. And um, you saw it in one of the earlier um, uh, pictures where, the, where everyone's in front of the different flyers those flyers had stories to tell. And if you look very closely, we were at an um, exhibition in the Bronx not too long ago, and we were looking at some of the very interesting messages and very powerful messages that were being sent to the community about what was going on in the world. That was all a part of it. So it was really being self-sufficient and creating your own. The fact that they went from A Jazz with one S to A Jazz with two S's was the fact that they then got their own studio. So then they could have their own functions. They could have, I think at one point there was a Grand Daza Cafe, right? And so they had a place where you can go and eat and, and, and be um, within the community. So it was, it was really about the community building. So Mimi, can you give us a sense then, if we're talking about do it yourself in terms of, of creating your own fashion, stitching your own sartorial futures, if you will, um, where would an everyday black woman shop in the 1960s or 70s in New York City, for example, if they weren't buying haute couture, um, if, or if they weren't buy, shopping from a, at a department store? In the 60s and 70s? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at that time, um, a lot of women were making their own clothes, I think, or they were shopping very locally. I think it was definitely within the community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know even how much real department store shopping might have been taking place, but I think for sure it was a time where, I mean, I think also patterns were really um, popular at that yeah. time. I think a lot of um, people would see what was going on in fashion abroad and then they would buy the pattern and, um, 
you know, uh, because they had more time, because they weren't always on social media, they could sew their own clothes <laughs> right, and right. stuff. And so I love social media, by the way, but I'm just saying they could sew their own clothes and they could do things like that. So I really think it was um, taking ownership. I think a lot of women had those skills yeah. back then, and it was really important to them because um, when you say do it yourself too, it wasn't about like, now where people, I, I feel like people like to follow trends or see someone and then they want to look like someone. I think that that was a time where it was like, well, this is what looks good on me, right. you know, and being able to um, understand that, you know, it's not so much about what you're wearing, but it's your own confidence and how you want to reflect it and how you want to show yourself, you know, to society. Yeah, and I actually, I talk about this a little bit in the, in the article in the book, that was the rise, the 60s were the rise of the boutique, right? And so that's when people started kind of pushing away, even from, in generally, as a, as a society, away from kind of department store shopping. And then boutiques started to pop up, both, um, you know, Fifth Avenue and things like that, but also uptown in Harlem and Brooklyn and things like that. So the, the rise of the boutique also played a role in it. And then you had proprietors that were coming from the community who, who owned those boutiques. You know, this was my mother's era, okay? So I have tons of pictures in my own personal archive of my mother in clothes of her own design. One of them in includes a, Z a, a maxi length, zebra printed dress with a matching head wrap um, that she strutted around on her campus at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana wearing, okay? So um, of course for the book I had to interview her to uh, learn more about this, but I think it's, it's really a shame to see the breakdown in sewing as a tradition being passed on. You know, my mother sewed, but I didn't grow up sewing, you know? Um, that's why I'm in awe of people like you, Mimi, with all these, oh. these skills. You said, no, you said, I design, I don't. <laughs> you know, my sewing skills are actually not that. I mean, nowadays, it's just like, you know, the trade mm -hmm. is not really taught that much in school. That's like an ongoing conversation in a lot of schools mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, now it's about design. You know, we do a lot of things on computer. Um, you know, I do still sketch, but I prefer to sketch on computer, and some people think it's a crime, but, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just what it is of, you know, it's just what's going on now, and so, um, you know, it's fashion, it does have to change, mm -hmm. you know, and it's nice to hold on to the traditions, and I do think that the skills are important, but, um, um, you know. Things change, so. <laughs> Things change. Um, so I want to go back to something that you mentioned before, Mimi, because I thought it was really important. And that's this idea that uh, people in the United States and even uh, in, in Europe and across the African continent aren't simply looking at folks in their neighborhood. People, you know, we, we have to really think about the cosmopolitan vantage point. Um, through which black folks are seeing the world at this time. And so I'm thinking about then the cultural and political exchange that's happening across the black Atlantic, if you will, between uh, women like the Grandassa models in New York and various designers and models on the continent. And so I, as we're thinking about New York City as a fashion capital, I'm wondering what does this exchange look like um, if we were to approach it from one of the various fashion capitals in, um, on the continent, say, for example, Accra or Dakar or Nairobi or Johannesburg? Um, well, during that time period, what, what I've noticed is that, you know, you would think that there was something really different going on in, I'll just say West Africa, because I'm, I'm from Ghana and I know that part specifically, but, um, but actually um, it was reflecting. You know, because at the time, I think it was this, you know, we were embracing that it was gonna be Western fashion. And what Western fashion means to me when, when I'm saying is just that, you know, people like American fashion because it's kind of comfortable. You know, you just wanna wear a skirt and a top and pants and, and that kind of, you know, getting into the leisure activities, getting into just simplicity of your clothes was what was winning at the time. You know, couture dressing, where things are very fitted to your body, that is increasingly, increasingly decreased over time because people want comfort. And when you look at what was going on, if you look at pictures from like Malik Sidibe or um, um, uh, K2, you know, you see that the pictures kind of have a, a similar kind of feel as to some of these images, and it was the same time frame. Right. So, you know, in Africa and in Ghana and in, you know, Senegal and all those um, places, their own movement of how 
their own interpretation of Western fashion was taking place, and it was very similar. So I don't really see it as so much of a disconnect because um, it was just that these are the clothes that um, everybody wants to wear, and this is how I'm gonna do my version of it. And I think that it was reflecting both ways. Exactly, I love that more complex picture of exchange, right? That's not just flowing in one direction. It's really a, a cultural and political exchange. And with that said, um, Kwame, I know that by the time we get to the mid 1960s, the naturally shows they, they, you know they're taking the show on the road. There are new models coming into the Grandassa modeling troupe, and your father and your uncle also too start to travel throughout the the continent, um, engaging in on the ground movements there. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about. Um, your father's photography during this moment of very intense political upheaval in the, the once we get to the mid 1960s. So, um, you know, they they became. Uh, uh, I, I like to say that um, while um, there is a very different um, movement, they were they were the, they were part of the Black Arts Movement. Um, some people sometimes confuse them with the Black Panther Movement. But one of the things that I find um, uh, really interesting is that they were, they were a little bit more uh, Malcolm than Martin. And so one of the things that they did was they were looking to be very active with the people um, in, on the continent. They were looking to be more um, involved in liberation. And so one of the things that um, I find really interesting about the photography is that when you have, uh, when you look through it, and, and these are more of the kind of the origin images of the Black is Beautiful movement, but when you start to go through the pictures in this archive, they were, they were documenting everything from the work that was happening in Namibia with Sam Mignomo and him um, trying to help their country gain his independence. Um, trips to uh, um, multiple African countries, Tanzania, uh, Ghana, um, South Africa. And so what they were doing was creating that exchange. And um, my uncle Alambe, who was one of the great orders of, you know, in, in my opinion, of the world, he could talk and tell a story about what was happening. And my father was there to document it. And so, um, as a as a kind of a duo, they went out to the world. But it was it wasn't just them. It was it was Ajaz. It was the Grandasses. It was all a partnership. And there were other movements that they partnered with to make sure that the word got out. And so as they started to travel the cities, um, both um, nationally and internationally, that was the word. And so they they were known. The groups were known as the ambassadors to both. Um, you know, the struggle here and the struggle in the diaspora. In fact, you know, my, my name is Kwame because my father was a big follower of Kwame Nkrumah and loved what he was doing, so he changed his name. I won't tell you what that was, but some people know it. And so he changed his name to Kwame and named me Kwame, so, you know, the running joke is that I'm Kwame Senior, so, but. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, as we're kind of moving ahead in time here, I wanna ask you all, what was your first personal encounter with this phrase or the idea of black is beautiful? I mean, of course, you grew up with this in your home, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to know, like, when did you, when did this as a term first start to resonate with you? You know, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because it was, I mean, it was, it was like, it was part of me, so I, I don't know how um, to correctly um, kind of express that, but I, I just know, you know, our our time together as as a family uh, extended as well. I mean, I would I, I remember being very aware of what was happening as a young boy, right around like five six, when my father would take me. So my my parents would take turns taking me on Sunday. So my mom would take me to church one Sunday, and then the next Sunday I would spend with my dad, and that Sunday would be spent in meetings. <laughs> talking about what was happening and you know as at that age you're you're somewhat listening but you're you know you're it's it's a little bit too much to process but it was part of me so it was it just became a part of you know the everyday um being at the meetings with you know with the group talking about what was happening and going to the the school on a wednesday night to hear the talks it was it was just a part of you know who i was and so the black is beautiful was just it's 
it's it's in me. I, I I think that's probably the best way to describe it. It was, you know, they were, they um, my family, um, I mean, they really represented that mm -hmm. to me. So yeah. So Mimi, I want to pose that question to you too, but folding it into one that also asks you to tell us a little bit about where, from where you draw inspiration for your designs. Um, well, I mean, just like Kwame said, for me, it's actually difficult to pinpoint where that phrase came into like a strong meaning because um, I just think that it's something that's always kind of just been there from the time that I was little. And if I had to guess where that phrase came from, I would have thought the 70s was when that phrase came to be, you know, just from growing up and never meeting you or knowing anything about um, the, the statement. But I mean, I, I guess maybe in school, <laughs> I don't know, in college, but because, I mean, in our house it was very different because I, I grew up in, um, I was born in Ghana and I came to the U.S. when I was five years old, and I'm the youngest of five children, and I'm five years apart from the next one. So they all had accents, and they all spoke the language in the house, which I understand but don't speak very well. And, um, and so my experience, like growing up in a house that was very traditional, but a lot of my friends were a mix of African American, and um, and I grew up in a in a largely Latino community, and so um, I think that our experience was just that. Like my mom, I always considered her to be very beautiful, and I always thought my sisters were beautiful. So it was never really like an issue around. Um, it being anything, it just felt really natural. And the first time I ever went back to Ghana, it's, it's, um, there's something to be said about the experience of being somewhere where everybody looks like you and when you turn on the TV, you know, that's all you see and everything. So your images of things, I don't know, it's not the same as like growing up in the US and because here, unfortunately, I just think everything has to always be based on race when there's other things in life too. But you know, um, I don't know, so for me, I hope I kind of answered that, but yeah. that's... There's an image behind you, I don't know if you can see it, but can you tell us a little bit about these um, garments in your line? Um, yes. So, um, so this is um, an image from one of the first collections that we ever did. Uh, it was from a collection um, that I call Scarred Perfection. My mom had a scar on her cheek and um, I used to just ask her where she got it from, and she said that it was done when she was 13. It was a ritual that she had gone through, a scarification, and um, I liked it. I thought it was cool, and I always wanted to um, you know, investigate it, and when I used to see fashions that were inspired by Africa, it was always about prints and color and you know, fabrics that are not even traditionally African. And so I wanted to shed the, a different kind of light on, on fashion that could be inspired by Africa. And I wanted to show it in a very new way. Um, so a lot of this is um, trapunto embroidery, which is an Italian stuffing technique. So there's actually yarns in every single one of those lines. And it's all done by hand. And it's um, done in leather because leather is also a skin. So it's the whole idea of the relationship of the scars on the skin and then, you know, these scars on your body and they're decorating your body. So, um, you know, it's, I feel like the clothes tell stories. Um, in the markings, because all the markings had meanings. And it was something where a lot of times um, people, when I first started, they were like, are you sure you want to do a show about that? I mean, it's not really positive, it's kind of barbaric. And I'm like, well, maybe it's barbaric to you. But for me, you know, I felt like it was something that was very beautiful. And um, I wanted to showcase a different light and also create fashion that when you looked at it, you just liked what it was, and then later on you can maybe find out about the story, but it didn't have to necessarily um, be in your face. And so, um, you know, these garments are, are a continuation. I'm constantly trying to find out how I can use the scarification in a new way, but it's really about showcasing something that at a time, like even a lot of these images, I, I did a project where I worked with a professor and I didn't know, but she told me that a lot of the images of um, the African people that were taking their bodies, it was to actually show that they were primitive. 
And um, I don't look at it that way. Like to me, um, they were signs of, um, it was about being erotic. They were seen as like sexual. They were seen as being beautiful. They were seen as telling stories about different times and periods of your life. And, um, and I just wanted to showcase them in a way that a lot of different women around the world would you know, gravitate to and think it was beautiful. Genius, this one right here. <laughs> yeah, I've been a huge fan ever since I, I first heard Mimi speak about her work at FIT. I was like, okay, I have to meet, I have to meet her. <laughs> One of the other things I, I love about your work is that I, I think you um, you push past the the gender binary in certain ways, and and you allow us to think more expansively about beauty. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, why, when we talk about beauty, we normally we normally or typically think about it through a normative lens, and where does black queer or androgynous fashion fit into this conversation about fashion and consciousness? Um, well, I think if we're thinking about fashion and what's modern and what's new, we have to think about the different types of bodies that are gonna be wearing these clothes. I mean, every single um, time frame or moment, we're trying to push ideals of acceptance and um, we wanna be accepted. Um, you know, people who are in the queer community want to be accepted. And when that happens all the way, which is now is just a tip of, you know, the iceberg, but when it happens, what about, the, what, are, what are they going to wear? And how are you going to showcase their beauty? So I think there's been brands that have been focusing on, um, on, on ways to express that, but I don't think that it's been expressed in the way that it can. And even by, you know, me, it's not something I think about all the time, but, um, but I think that you know, in the future, if we're gonna think about dressing more and more bodies, I just think that we have to also think about the way that different people fit in things. And I think it's more so about you know, seeing yourself, which was what your, um, the whole movement was about, which is not what we're doing in fashion, but it's a deeper conversation than just saying that we only want you know, skinny, slender people in the clothes. I mean, there's a reason behind it too. It's not just because we think they look, they're the beauty standard. It's just as designers, we kind of selfishly want the clothes to hang off of people, you know, which is you know, good or bad, but people need to know why. It's not just because we think that this is what beauty is. And so, um, you know, I think the more and more we get to show different types of, of looks, and the more and more we are more accepting of more people, I think that, um, you know, we can embrace different cultures and different um, humans. You know, so I think that's more so the future. I think we haven't even touched upon it yet, but it is, you know, it's important. You know, so I'm gonna um, pause here on this picture because so much of what you were saying, <laughs> so much of what you were saying, Mimi, um, makes me think about the the conversations that were taking place visually and through fashion in the 1960s and 70s, where too there was a conversation about um, androgyny and gender bending and gender blending and messing with the, the gender binary. Um, <clears throat> but also when I think about the similarities between that time period, I think about some of the connective tissue between the, the, the fashions we saw in your images and also the fashions that we see in the images of the Grandasa models. And so I'm just wondering if we could look at a few of these images here and tell me, do you all see similarities between these two bodies of work or, or is it just me? Well, I certainly do. Um, I think, um, you know, as we were talking about when we were putting this together, um, initially it was Tanisha and myself, and Tanisha and I were talking about how we could maybe make it a little bit more, you know, thorough and fruitful as what we're talking about fashion, right? Um, and uh, when uh, uh, Tanisha suggested your work, and I started to look through and kind of really look into the work, I was like, this is a perfect marriage of what a lot of what we're seeing, especially when you look at the rich colors and you look at the, the beauty in, in, in a very simplistic manner about showcasing the beauty and the, and the fashion and, and what's there, it, it certainly resonated to me, so that's, that's my. 
Um, the way that I feel that our work is, is similar is, um, is in this idea of the Grandassa woman who is an independent woman who is interested and confident in her own sense of self and expressing it in the way that that is. And when I'm designing, the kind of woman that I'm thinking about is somebody who's not, um, you know, she's not going to be a slave to a monogram. She's not looking for that. She's not looking for, you know, wearing the next it bag to feel like she's somebody. She's already that person. And I think that that's, you know, the, the woman that I think you guys wanted in your work and the women that you shot. And so, you know, it's this idea that you don't have to follow, you know, and because um, I think the type of woman that's going to wear leather, you know, bonded to her body is, is a specific woman. So, um, you know, it's, it's just that idea of like designing for, you know, this woman that is strong and confident most of all, and really believes in her own sense of self and wants to put herself out there in the world under her own ter terms, so. So Kwame, we're getting ready to bring your father up to the stage, but I'm wondering if you could just tell us very quickly who this particular woman is in the photo. <laughs> well, uh, this particular woman is my mom. Um, it's one of the. It's one of my favorite images, obviously. Um, and actually, if you go through the next two slides you'll see one of my other favorite images of my Aunt Noomsa, um, which is, which when you look back at just, I mean, the pattern, her beauty, I mean, this is exactly what you talk about, these independent, strong women who, you know, took charge and, 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 and ended up uh, being part of a very incredible movement. Brenda Deaver. This is this is one of my favorites. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I want that garment is, right now. <laughs> it's just it's it's phenomenal. We got to figure out who that designer is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's see All right. So we're gonna transition now. Um, you're gonna get to hear from the man himself, who we have in the audience with us, um, Mr. Kwame Brathwaite Sr. So while he's making his way up here, I'm going to tell you a, a quick story. After I found those images in the archive at the Schomburg, um, I had to interview him. I was trying to track him down. <laughs> so I found his email address. And I, I swear, I, I, I emailed him relentlessly for a few months straight and never heard anything back. And I was so heartbroken because <laughs> I had to end up finishing my dissertation and then writing a whole book without having a chance to interview him. But fortunately, the way things work, the way the universe aligns, uh, Kwame Jr. and I were able to connect and I was finally able to meet and interview <laughs> Kwame Bradley. <laughs> Yeah, it's on. Actually, yeah, that, that's, um, you know, and I have, to, I have to thank the Museum of the City of New York for that because when they were putting together the exhibition, uh, they said, well, you know what, we want to use your father's pictures and uh, we just need a, a short narrative about the work. And so I was like, oh, okay, who's going to write that? And they're like, you are. <laughs> I said, oh, but I'm not a writer. <laughs> and they said, well... Yeah, you, you can handle it. And so I, I started to write it, but you know, with a family this rich in tradition and oral history, I was going very much off of what they had been telling me. And I said, I have to validate this somehow, right? I have to find, <laughs> you know, I can't just tell stories like family stories um, and write it for a book. Uh, I, have to, I have to find the real information. So as I was looking up actually one of the, the jazz album covers that you talk about um, in the book, uh, it was a, there was actually a picture of uh, my Aunt Noomsa on the cover of a Lou, Lou Donaldson album, and I was trying to find the year. And as I was doing a Google search, up pops this narrative about the Grandassa models, and it had the year, and I'm sitting there like, who is this woman? <laughs> Where did this research come from? Because, you know, I, 
I know she hadn't spoken to him because I, I asked, I said, do you know Tanisha Ford? And he goes, no. And so I said, this is amazing. So I literally called my wife, Robin. I'm like, Robin, you have to see this. And so as I started to look, I just, I literally just emailed Tanisha and said, I need, I'm Kwame Brathway Jr. You talk about the Grandasses and the Ajaz in, in an entire chapter in Liberated Threads. And I said, this is amazing. I really have to, the next time I'm in New York, I really need to meet you. And so that's how that all started. And it's been, it's been fantastic dealing with, working with Tanisha. <laughs> So Mr. Brathway, tell us, when, when you all were forming AJAZ and you're just a bunch of entrepreneurial teenagers, what was your aim? What did you want, what was your vision for, a, for AJAZ? Well, our vision for AJAZ was to make uh, black folks feel that they are somebody too, mm -hmm. that they are great and they must take on their own responsibility of showing themselves and, and, uh, and, 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 and marking our way in, in this, in this uh, society, in this, in this world. And um, that's when we uh, decided to form the Grand Dyson Models as a group. Um, Just turn it off. Yeah. Underneath. Yeah, yeah. I did. All right? OK, good. <laughs> and, um, and that's when we started getting together with some of the other artists and some uh, old uh, friends that we had uh, either um, promoted other things with, uh, fashion shows, um, getting all together with a lot of the, uh, the musicians yeah. who, who were very, very supportive of our space people like uh, <laughs> Max Roach and Abby Lincoln and and uh, a whole a whole bunch. Of, they, they 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 fell right in line for the most part, and um, and of course that gave us a big jump on it because when we were doing things that uh, we uh, uh, wanted prom to promote, or they, every time they see one of those names up there that they recognize and love and everything else. Uh, we had an audience, <laughs> you know, and, um, and people fell right in line. People were supportive, very, very supportive uh, of what we were doing. And, you know, you've touched many lives, um, not only in just the local Harlem community, but everywhere that the um, Grandassa models toured, and also all the places across the continent that you traveled. Um, and your photography has been featured in magazines around the world, including magazines printed in, in Japan and in the United Kingdom. But as of late, you've been getting a lot of attention for this photography of oh, yours. Yeah. How, how are, how are you handling your newfound success? <laughs> Just trying to get along and trying to keep, keep it going, keep it going, due to this guy. <laughs> Because for so long, you know, you were the keeper of the images, the man behind the camera. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering then, what do you want your legacy to be? I love black people. <laughs> right. Thank you for that. I think that's, a, that's an amazing point to end. What else, what more is there to say? So uh, please join me in giving um, a round of applause to our panelists. Bravo, bravo, bravissimo. So we have about 10 minutes or so for questions that, um, from the audience. So I'm going to, if you raise your hand, hi, I think we have some microphones. Someone can bring a microphone around to you and you can ask a brief question and then the panelists will, will field the questions. 
Thank you. This was an amazing uh, panel. And this one is directed to uh, Mr. Braithwaite Sr. Um, at the risk of telling my age, when I was probably around six or seven years old, I grew up in Detroit, um, I remember my father and a bunch of his friends got together and they started this business where they were printing all these uh, black power emblems on like magaz on um, napkins and, place and, and paper plates and all that. And they had a big expo. And it was called the Black is Beautiful Expo. And this expo actually sold out Cobo Hall. Uh, and it wasn't just him. It was a bunch of folks. And people came in from all over. And I'm just curious to know, was this a part of or an outgrowth of what you all were doing? I don't know if you know anything about it, but it was, uh, it, it was pretty, uh, pretty substantial. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, yes. Well, you know, it was our group and other groups also that, you know, followed that kind of trend and whatnot. And, and we got together and did things together. We did things in supporting one another's uh, affairs and whatnot. But the main thing was to get it out to the people. Exactly. I think we have a question here. Good evening. I'd like to know, this, this question is for Kwame Brathwaite Sr. I'd like to know how, when did you become interested in photography? And how old were you? I got interested in photography um, when I was in high school, but mainly right, well, yeah, I would say in, uh, in, in, in high school, uh, but also um, because of what uh, I learned from my uncle uh, who lived with us, my mother's brother, and uh, who had, was a, 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 a worker in a steel, uh, steel uh, mill in, um, Jersey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got we got to keep it. Um, and we were also we were doing our concerts, HS, and one of the photographers. They, we were in a group, but that came by, and um, he was one of the uh, photographer from um, the same school I went to, School of Industrial Art. And um, he was there taking pictures, you know, at our, you know, at his uh, show. And I watched, and I'm saying, hey, he is taking these pictures with no flash, you know? I'm saying that. And I watched him, and he came back next day, uh, the next show. The show we were doing, the natural show. The, 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 um, uh, yeah, the natural show. No, it wasn't the natural show. Yet. Um, it was, we were building it, building it. But anyhow. Um, and then I talked to him, and you know, he said, "Well, you know, yeah." He said, "Well, this is Tri-X film and whatnot, you know, and uh, you know, um, you don't need much flash and whatnot, da 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 da, da you know." So I started. Uh, I went out and I forget which film company, which uh, film company was uh, that. Uh, I went out and bought some film. And I started taking uh, some shots with this uh, camera that my uh, parents had given me for um, my graduation. And I had my point and shoot, August 75, that they had given me. Oh. And, um, <laughs> and when I uh, tried to do that, I said, well, you know, you, you need highest films, high speed film. You used to tell me about uh, 
uh, the film, Tri-X film. And so I tried to shoot some things with, um, with Tri-X. Uh, which, but I had to, you know, shoot the film, um, eject the, the flash, flash, uh, Oh. Yeah, flash bulb. There you go. Thank you, God. <laughs> uh, flash bulb. While it was hot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> drop it off, put in another bulb, da 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 da. da you know, and um, I said I got to do better than this. I got to do something. And that's when I got my first uh, um, uh, professional camera. And, uh, This question is actually for Kwame. I don't know what to call you because we're friends. Junior? Set? Okay. I want to know, since we are friends and I've seen you take pictures of my children when they were young, when did you first start taking photography uh, as a hobby and f share the same love, I, I guess, as your father did? And also, do your children realize what a big deal their grandfather is at this particular moment? <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, I, I, like I said before, I used to spend, I used to kind of alternate Sundays with my mother and my father. Uh, as I got older, uh, one of the things that happened was I would spend the day with him, either going out to shoot, you know, shows or going out to do different things. And right around my, um, I was about 16, and I got the opportunity to work with him. I was his assistant for the summer. Uh, and it was really interesting because one of the things that I got to do was be with him in his element. And so uh, unlike now, when he's, he's a lot more talkative, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you know, did you get your homework done? Okay, all right, that's it. So that was pretty much the conversations <laughs> that we would have. And so one of the things that happened um, in that summer was I got to spend time with him. But interestingly enough, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of words being exchanged. It was, but when he started to go into the process of putting the you know the film, developing the film, putting in the developer, burning in the images, the the process, his art, that's when he would start to talk and, and kind of explain those things to me. And so I started to get into photography. I actually at one point contemplating getting my MFA in photography, and then I realized the difference. There was a really big difference. Um, obviously, he's a, he's a magnificent photographer. Um, and at that time, this is when digital started to come about. And so I recognized that a lot of people would be able to shoot and, and make these really beautiful images. And I didn't necessarily have, I could learn the technical aspect of things. I, have a, I think I have a pretty good eye. But I didn't have the access. And the access is what was different. Um, the fact that he was with Max and Abby Lincoln and then Bob Marley and Muhammad Ali and all those different people and, and then the political Stevie Wonder and all those different things. And so one, you know, <laughs> happy birthday, Bob Marley, by the way. Um, so it was a really interesting thing for me to do, but I, I recognize that it would have been, been a hard path um, to go along. But as far as the grandchildren, my, my three children are very excited about it. And, and here's a funny little antidote. So my, my middle son, I have Jackson, Carter, and Kennedy, not after president's last names, his first names, just, just to make that clear. So Carter, who is now eight, we were at the, um, we were at the, we're getting sneakers. And he typically likes really kind of just out there sneakers, just colors, everything, right? And so we go and he chooses these, sneakers. I'm like, Carter, they're, they're all black. He goes, black is beautiful, Dad. Back here. There we go. Hi. Um, you mentioned something earlier about social media. And I'm 16, and I grew up in a house where black is beautiful was all around me. And um, social media has played a really big part in helping instill that. So I was just curious as to, this is for anyone, um, how do you think social media plays a part in instilling Black is Beautiful in a more modern sense of fashion? Um, uh, 
Um, well, the fact that social media is a platform that a lot of people can use, you know, gives a lot of people access to be able to put their opinions out there of what they like and what they don't like. And, and I think that social media can be good and bad. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, getting caught up in a world, it can be for fun, it can be for business, but I think there's also like the real, real world too. And I think that trying to find or showcase like trends that you find online, I think you can do it, but, um, but I think that, you know, there's more lessons to be learned in what's real and what's around you. So I think if you can look at social media as a tool, but not the, the necessary truth, you know, unless you're following somebody who, you know, is giving truth, but I wouldn't put all my thoughts and my, um, me personally, I'm just saying, I wouldn't put it all on social media because I just feel like a lot of things are not real. And um, yes, you can push movements through, but Movement should also be about encompassing a lot of people and everybody doesn't have to believe the same things, you know? There's like a lot of bullying going on if you disagree with someone or you don't like something. I just think, you know, as long as you can feel your own strength, it should come from somewhere else, not social media. But that can be a tool that you can use, you know, to learn things. Actually, I'm, I hope, yeah. So we have time for one more question, I think. So let's take, let's go here in the middle. We haven't gotten anything from someone in the middle. Okay, I wanted to address something. Well, what Tanisha brought up and what Mimi brought up about the origins of black consciousness or black is beautiful. I mean, one of the reasons I think Mimi hit it on the head is the fact that you have social media now. So some of these things can get out and they can get out easy, these stories. For example, my uncle Kwame uh, probably could tell a story about um, the Black is Beautiful in Africa very easily. In fact, when he and I were in Zimbabwe, um, the parallels between what, hap what happens in Africa in terms of Black is Beautiful, where Mimi is from, as, as opposed to here, but not, well, I shouldn't say what I mean. From Ghana, we should be specific, we were in uh, Zimbabwe. And the guy we were interviewing said, um, you know, we got our ideas, we were influenced by you all in the States. You know, we were reading Marcus Garvey, we were reading these sort of things here. So to help them with their liberation struggle and get free, they were being inspired by what was happening here in the United States. Now, of course, um, Black is Beautiful actually began with Marcus Garvey, who influenced everybody from A-Jazz. And this is one of A-Jazz members right here, Bob Gums, one of the original founders, one of the members here also. So, they, you know, so these things don't happen in a vacuum. If you go look up Black is Beautiful, let's say a lot of young people who use social media, they'll go to what? Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia will just say that Black is Beautiful, happened and started with African Americans in the 60s, but then they have a whole thing about Stephen Biko and black consciousness and black is beautiful in South Africa. But Stephen Biko was at least 10 years older than my uncle or my father, and he was influenced by them. A lot of his flies and the work that they did with liberal Younger. Younger, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's 10 years younger. Stephen Biko, you know, this whole representation of him, I mean, he's a colleague. You know, a much younger colleague, but these influences by him, these influences uh, that he had definitely came from within the United States, emanating from Garvey to Carlos Cooks to Ilambe Kwame, Ajaz, and all these people. The, the connections are there, but sometimes, you know, it's a process to get, documenta to get documentation. Uh, Bob Gums can tell you of Eldridge Cleaver. When he first saw the Grand Astro Models, when before he did the book Solar Dad, he was blown away. So he wrote a letter to Ajaz, you know, talking about, in fact, it was Bob Gum's sister, who he was just, he needed to have her. He wanted to, <laughs> he wanted to, he wanted to meet her. You know what I mean? This, this letter is about 50 some plus years old, but um, you know, to, it's one thing to tell a story, but it's another thing to actually have that letter in your hand, as my cousin Kwame talked about. Some of the times it's a story about 
documenting it and showing the proof of the legacy and the history. Or, because we can even talk about James Brown. Before James Brown came out with Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, he had seen the Grand Dassa models on 125th Street where they did most of their work at. And he had this sort of experience. Yeah. But it's another thing to connect those things um, through the documentation, like uh, <clears throat> what you do, you know, and exactly. put it in books and so say it in there. But it, mean, it's, it's all this. there for the, to, for the writing in the future. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, great point, great point. So um, unfortunately, we've, we've come to the end of our event for tonight. And, uh, but before we close, I, I wanna give the panelists perhaps 60 seconds or less to tell us what they're up to and how we can get in contact with them um, in the future, so. Um, really quickly, um, you know, we're always doing shows. We do our, our shows mostly around the world. We just came from Nigeria. We like to show in, in different places for Fashion Week. Um, our website is mimiplonge.com, and our hashtag is mimiplonge, Instagram, and all those things. And just coming up, we're going to be launching our online store with, um, with new products. So come by and support and use that unity, you know? <laughs> So um, uh, one of we're we're doing a, a number of things uh, right now. Earlier today, I just signed a, a contract with Aperture Books to put his first um, book out, his photo book out. So um, <laughs> so that'll be out in um, look for that spring of 2019. Uh, the next uh, upcoming uh, exhibition. So right now. This synthetic moment is down at David Nolan Gallery. Uh, David Nolan is actually here. Um, so that's at David Nolan Gallery. That's on uh, 29th Street between 10th and 11th Avenues. And that is up through March 10th. So my father is part of a group show. It's a wonderful show. So check it out. Um, there's also the Armory Show coming up in New York on Piers 92 and 94, March 8th through 11th. So we'll have a number of images uh, in that show. And then Black Portraiture, uh, Tanisha and I will be on a panel with um, Michael Famigetti and Siobhan Carter David, another professor. Um, Michael's with Aperture and we're gonna talk about um, colorism within uh, the Caribbean communities and African communities and how his work uh, go goes to counteract that. So that's what's happening now. Uh, Kwame Brathwaite.com, very, very easy, and then um, if you can spell my last name. And then um, at Kwame B Photo is our Instagram as well as our Twitter feed, and then we have Kwame Brathwaite. Uh, you can look in Facebook. But I actually use Instagram as the, the primary feed, so if you see it on Instagram, it, it duplicates itself on Facebook. And then I have a quick announcement. The Grandassa Models will hold a 57th year reunion on March 24th of this year at the Dwyer Center. And I'm sure you can find more details out about that on the um, Call Me B Photo Instagram account. Um, again, I'd like to thank you all for being a magnificent audience, for asking engaging questions. And I'd like to encourage you to vi visit the Mod New York exhibition if you haven't already. Thank you and have an amazing night. Yeah.